Hi, we're Option Conservation, and this is the Shoe Room Sessions. Good afternoon, Charles. Good afternoon. How are you? Welcome to our first Shoot Room Session. Um, and that's the first thing we're going to talk about, right? So before I even ask who you are and why you're here, where are we? We are in the Shoot Room at Monaco Estate in North Devon. Nice, 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 nice. And who are you and what do you do here? Uh, I am Charles Owen. I am the estate manager of Mornicott. What do I do? Um, very difficult question. I think. Some would say not that much. No, I'm joking. Yes. <laughs> I'm joking. I think uh, Jack of all trades, master of none. But in essence, I look after the data running the state and everything that involves. Perfect. And how long have you been at Monaco? 15 years. So take us on that journey. How did you end up here? Long story. How long have we got? Short. Two paragraphs. Tell us your Two backstory. Two paragraphs. Yeah. Right. Uh, and if you're entertaining, I'll let you go to three. <laughs> um, so, left university, set up a commercial pheasant shoot in in Hampshire. And your degree was in? Three-dimensional design. Obvious jump to pheasant shooting. Yeah. Designing pheasant? Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. So, and then um, decided it wasn't for me. And I was going to go and be a teacher, actually. Kind of quite sporty. Well, are you going to teach PE? PE and art and design. Nice. Okay. So then the previous owner of Warnicott knew me and contacted my father initially and said he was buying an estate in North Devon and he wanted to canvas people's opinions about what they can do with it. And so I got tasked to come down and have a look at it. And how long had he had it when you first arrived? About... Nine months. Okay. Like so enough time to have a broad feel for what was going on on yeah. the ground. But, okay. yeah. And so I came down to have a look for a weekend and fell in love with the place. I went back and said, this is what I think you should do of it. And uh, he then spent the next two weeks convincing me to come and run it for him. So. The echoes there are amazing because part of the genesis of auction conservation was me talking to the board about what it could be without necessarily assuming I'd be doing it. And then they spent a period going, no, no, no. You need to come and do this. So it's, it's really interesting that that's there. Um, okay, so that's 15 years ago. And what are the big chapters of your time here? If you had to, like, categorize it into books or chat, what would they be? What are the key things? I would say when we came, there was nothing here. I think we had 300 acres. So the initial setup was property and setting up all the uh, converting all the, all the buildings, as we did with the shoot room, uh, into holiday cottages, uh, into the shoot room, in North Paul and other facilities that we have. So that was a major task, a major chapter. So that's year one to year... Nine. Nine years of... Nine years, years of builders. Um, yeah. Setting up the commercial first institute. Um, that was probably in full swing after about five years. We have more land acquisitions and renting some more land. So over that period, so we're at just shy of 800 now. Um, yeah. So that's a heck of a load of acquisitions. And how many buildings total have you renovated? a very good question um three holiday cottages three holiday cottages shoot room shoot room car barn uh, house cottage house cottage of i would say more than 10 yeah and the pool and the pool yeah question barn l's off camera pool. doing this pool of the yeah. Girl. Um, so yeah more than 10 yeah that's amazing okay so and then um so the shoot was pretty well where it needed to be after about five years in terms of numbers of days and things um at the same time of that, we set up the farm and grew the farm to what it was. Um, it started off with nothing. Obviously, we went into uh, Pedigree Red Devon cattle. Then we slowly merged into making a breed that worked better for us because the Devon's quite small. So we added some Angus, crossbred them, and played with that. Then we let the sheep numbers come up. So, yeah, and built that up at the same time. So I would say most of everything was done within the first 10 years. And the last five years was running it. Okay. And that, and my sense is that's the bit that, so you had the, the sort of learning development phase, the building phase, mm -hmm. then you hit the shoot phase and, and land acquisition side of it and things. And is that when the real experiential side of it kicked in, the, the visitors ramped up and the quality of what you were offering? Yeah. So the last five years, I think, was given the rewards for everything we'd learned um, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the previous term. I think it's really, people assume change with land is that all right on the table there yeah i think people assume the change with land happens so quickly every time we go to a site, what are you going to do with it we're like 
we need a year to even have an idea of what's going on. We're really fortunate here because you've moved across with the estate, which is uh, possibly one of the best acquisitions you've ever made. So thank you very much for coming um, and for staying with us. But where we don't have that and we don't have that continuity, you know, it's going to take us a year to learn how the estate works with you anyway mm -hmm. and your views and our views and how that looks like. So we're states where we haven't got the sort of pleasure or the opportunity with an estate manager. It just takes so long to learn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got 15 years that you did perfectly in three paragraphs there. Thank you. Um, and we're going to take that long to really build things and have things in place, which is one of the really exciting things about Monocop because it is a brilliant offering at a quality, at a way we can welcome people to, to places like the shoot room, which we'll come on to. Um, and that's what's really exciting for our other estates that aren't there and at mm -hmm. different stages. We've got things that are essentially 15 years back from where you were that need properties completely done, things smaller, things bigger. So this is why this is really exciting. Um, so the shoot room, tell us why it's called the shoot room. Do you know, I can't remember the initial naming ceremony of the shoot room. Breaking a bottle of very nice red wine against the wall or port or... I remember painting the, uh, the skirting boards at midnight before the first guest came in, but... Delicious. Um, I think there was a little cottage that there used to be a kick around shoot here before we came that was called the shoot room. And I think we just stole the name. It was like a sort of, a, what are we going to call that? It's the yeah. shoot room. Um, so yeah, I think that's where the name originally came from. So one of our big changes we've made since coming here has been from day one, being really clear with the previous owners who we had a great relationship with in terms of buying, but said, you know, we've got different objectives for the place. The shoot won't be remaining. I think one of the important things I felt we did was to communicate that early and be clear that that's, that's where we'd be. So there weren't unnecessary expectations or so we were really clear about it. But then that prompted a question of what should we call this place? Mm -hmm. And I know your sort of feeling was that I'd be really uncomfortable with calling it shoot room yeah. still. Um, so I guess the first bit to explore is what did you think when you heard about, I guess you can go either the, the place has been sold full stop mm -hmm. Or, well, in fact, yeah, that's the first question. The place has been full, sold full stop. And then when you found out we existed as a thing, what was your first sort of window into OC and what did you think? And I want full-blown... Full honesty. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, we all have our comfort zones, right? What I've done for the last 15 years is my comfort zone. Was I starting to get itchy? Yes, if I'm entirely honest. I like to be challenged. I, I, my brain is running 100 miles out all the time. Yeah. And I was starting to think, you know, where is this going? Um, when I heard the estate was for sale, my initial thing was comfort zone. So we've got to continue doing what we're doing. When I heard you, OC had, uh, was the purchaser, I looked up OC and I thought, okay. This is outside my comfort definitely zone. Definitely not comfort zone, right? It's definitely <laughs> this different. Is definitely not comfort yeah. zone. Where does this what does this mean for the estate and what does this mean for me um and then i think with everything you've got to look at it and decide every road in life has an opportunity yeah and for me i was of the age that i am quite driven um i like a challenge and i've sort of done the chapters or some of the chapters that we were doing as an estate and I think as you get older, you start to question things. And I was getting to that stage. So I was starting to question what we were doing and the future of that. So this was one of those situations where I, I sort of looked at the company and thought, initial thought was, it's out of my comfort zone. I don't like it. Then within a day or so, I thought, well, hang on a minute. You know, what are OC's values and where do they want to go? And then breaking them down and aligning them with me and what I want to do, I thought, actually, <laughs> this could really work because it ticks so many boxes. And it is outside my comfort zone, but in reality, we're not changing huge amounts. That's really interesting, isn't it? And so one of my sayings, I have tons, as everyone knows, is um, what is the opportunity this now gives us? Mm -hmm. So if you're playing a game of chess in life, um, thank you, Will. If you're playing a game of chess in life and suddenly you lose a piece, what's the opportunity you didn't have before? How do you relook at it? Otherwise, you mourn for a past state that you haven't got anymore, as opposed to, okay, with the pieces as they now sit, what's this leading me to that, that I didn't see previously? So uh, echoes in, in, in what you described there. Um, so you picked up on the fact that what was really changing 
And um, when we came and walked the other day, it was one of the questions I asked you that was kind of the genesis of, of doing this conversation. Because I remember saying to you, and, and I wasn't sure what the question was, whether it was why or how you were comfortable with us changing from what was a, you know, a high quality focused pheasant shoot here mm-hmm. um, and attracted lots of guests and was doing really well. And we pivoted to, no, no, no pheasants this year. So why were you fine with that? How were you? So I remember I chucked the question back to you, didn't I? And say, yeah. I said, what's changed? And that got me so excited because I hadn't thought about it that yeah. way. I was, I kind of felt guilty. I was like, because um, when we first came here, we, we had no idea when you inherit an estate, you have no idea. We often get asked, can you keep everybody on, on an estate? My answer is, yes, you can, but you shouldn't necessarily because... I view that we have really high performance standards. We're trying to do something completely different in a conservation space and, and just change the entire industry. And that requires people to perform at an absolute level. And that's not, you, if you haven't picked those people, you can't be sure they're going to be at that level. Mm-hmm. What was amazing when we met you, we came in, that first sort of introduction meeting you and the rest of the team. And I walked out and I went, if I'd have interviewed Charles, I'd have hired him, full stop. So I was uber excited at that point. And then each other meeting we've had with you and the team had, incredibly lucky to have you and and that's the example of if you get someone incredibly talented of course there's a place for them to stay but when we were talking off camera you described it as doing this job well is a lifestyle and a commitment it's not a job yeah and that's what you absolutely brought in spade brilliant that's very kind so so but to to answer the question um why am i comfortable moving away from it so easily i think in essence as an estate we did a lot of things Game shooting was one of those things. But actually, the shooting of the game was a very, very small part of, of that part of the estate and the business. So game shooting and the, well, the way I saw game shooting was so much conservation with a small amount of shooting. Yeah. But also it was doing something properly. Um, How you do anything you say, do everything. <laughs> providing a wonderful experience where people are being brought into the countryside and enjoying it. And taking away the game shooting element of that is leaving everything else that we already did. Yeah. So we're still we're still farming the estates. We've still got the ecotourism. Um and we are sort of merging the shoot with everything else we're doing, but not shooting. What's amazing is you you there are seeing what the additions are, not the subtraction. Yeah. Which I suppose comes back to the start of how you described what's the opportunity we get here? How do we take this on? And I think it's funny, isn't it? Coming into an estate, you you never know the time in people's lives, the situations, what they're experiencing, which is why we try and be patient and as open as possible. And we can't make everyone happy. Mm. But if there are people who want to try and move things to the next level, want to progress on, want to make conservation and the environment more of a feature of a place, we can make that a thing. And that comes back to where we're sat. So we sat in the shoot room and you started to think about other alternatives for the name for this place, right? Mm-hmm. And why was that? Why did you come up? Why did you feel about that? I think I have 15 years worth of memories, right, of this yeah. place and what it was used for and 15 wonderful years. And, you know, I have friends for life from that. Shooting brought us together, but shooting didn't bring us together. Enjoying the countryside brought us together. And... I think changing the name from the shoot room to something else for me is a clear break from that connection bringing us together. So changing it to something that's telling the story, yeah, for me is a sort of a that's the end of that chapter. This is the start of the next one. And and you thought I'd be uncomfortable because of the connotations yeah. with with the shooting. So I have such an interesting relationship with the, the shooting side of stuff. So uh, I struggle on a conceptual level because I don't want to kill anything. Um, however, certainly on the stalking side of it, I can I can stand on a hillside and I can see how it would be a, a romantic, a, a historic, a, a connecting with the environment experience. I can see why it would be enticing with someone. I just don't think I could pull the trigger and close my eyes and not, not see killing an animal. I, I'm not offended by the concept of others doing it. I just don't see a role for um, the introduction of pheasants and, and game birds into what we're doing. A deer management side of it, absolutely I do. Um, But I think what it's brought to the country, how it's countryside, how it's let land management evolve and things like that is such an important feature of the past that I don't want to greenwash the past. Mm -hmm. So I I love the fact that we'd still call this place the shoot room because 
if you were going to have a shoe room, this is gorgeous, and it's a and it's a legacy of what you and Andrew and Don built and created here. And that was the genesis for why we did our first shoot room session today, because I wanted to change the meaning of the word shoot, but still keep that history and conversation there. So it just felt appropriate that the first podcast conversation we should have was with the person that mainly built the shoot room. And we're now going to keep calling it the shoot room moving forward. So that takes us on to the future. So what's your aspirations for my, I mean, it's a cheat because I wouldn't give you this answer because I don't know, I'm just learning it, but you've got 15 years in. So what's your aspirations for the future of Monocot as a place? I would say we're converting the, the farmhouse into Sleeps 15 yeah. property. So that'll be how many people across the estate we could sleep? 35. So the ability to hire, to to rent an entire amazing conservation-focused country estate in Devon. There's not another one, right, that you could do that with? That we know, I don't know about the entire estate. I'm sure there is, but I don't okay. know one off the top of my head. Okay. Marketing, Charles. There's not another one. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so um, my sorry. Elle's dying off camera, laughing. My hope and wish is I want to be proud of everything I'm involved in, and Morlock is a very, very special place. So, converting the farmhouse into Sleeps 15 updating the other properties where we can, utilising all the spaces that we have available to us and just making the place really sing. So it is a special place to come and visit. And then slowly changing the farm and the land yeah. away from an intensive you know, beef and sheep farm and a, and a commercial pheasant shoot into the new chapter of its, of its sort of life and, and then inviting people in to visit that and see what we've done. I mean, I, I love... I'm one of these people that I love to. I love doing things, then bringing people in, and shouting. You are the most amazing host. So it's so funny seeing you operate. You cannot sit and not serve people and help them, and it's 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 wonderful to see. To the point where I have to say, Charles, please sit down. Let someone else do for me. <laughs> um, so you touched on some changes that are the future, but some that have already happened. So in terms of things we've done, reduction in certain types of livestock and taking pressure off the land. So can you talk a little bit about what we've done already? So uh, we've already reduced the cattle numbers by about 25%. Okay. Uh, we're going to reduce them further before the autumn. Oh, for the winter, sorry. Um, and the principal driver for that being? Uh, we're overpopulated. Yeah, okay. So we can better look after, provide food from the land for the cattle at lower numbers and less 100%. impact on the amount. Okay. 100%. In the past, we bought in a lot of feed for the cattle to maintain that level of stock density. Yeah. I think that's an important point that people don't think about. So the sustainability and, and regenerative nature of what we're able to do. If you cannot work within the carrying capacity of the land you've got and you need to pull from elsewhere, that's kind of a double negative because it's using the environment elsewhere and it's the movement, the miles and the carriage of stuff. So that's important. And in terms of the sheep side of stuff? The sheep um, have had their last day in Warnicott. They're still here at the moment, but the ewes will be being sold within the next two weeks. And the lambs will be sold on their fat. Yeah. And, and how do you feel about the, the sheep moving on and away? I'm completely relaxed about it. Okay. The cost? Uh, many, many reasons. One. I just don't like sheep, Rich. Well, there's, there's, there's three points about sheep. One. Uh, for avoidance of doubt, that's not a quote. I do like sheep yeah. in the right place. They're just not the right thing for everywhere before I get attacked for not liking sheep. We have lots of sheep. Sorry, Charles. Sheep are incredibly tasty and I love lamb. Ditto. Yeah. Um, there's always a problem. With sheep, they like to die. There's about a million ways a sheep can die. Um, so they are... One of the phrases we heard the most when we started oxygen conservation was, they just want to die. Yeah. And there's, uh, and we were shared with us various different social media channels of comedic ways sheep have got themselves into problems, upside down in a fence behind a cut, like just all over the place in terms of what they can achieve. I think the third point is, if you want a golf course as an estate... Sheep are your animal of choice. If you don't want a golf course, they're not. No. So so um, I've learned so many things in our time at Oxygen Conservation. The the importance of mouth shape, structure, tongue style and grazing behaviour of animals um, is one of the things I didn't anticipate learning, um, whilst inadvertently becoming a significant sheep farmer over the last couple of years. So, okay, so that's the cattle numbers reduced, sheep gone, entering organic conversion. Has that happened yet or do we have to wait? Not yet. yet? Okay. Uh, so as soon as possible, organic conversion, that's principle across all the estates, which is another really challenging one because it brings difficulties and makes things harder. Mm -hmm. But I think the principle for us is we want to be authentic about what we do, about doing the right thing for the environment. And we believe organic is the way to go. How does that sit with you as a concept? Absolutely. 
Nice. Okay, so that's that side of things. And then you mentioned about the farmhouse and we went through an invitation to partner activity with various designers to help with that. Um, we had lots of conversations about this and I hate the word tender because tender makes everything cheap and the lowest common denominator. And what we're trying to do is elevate the industry and make the environment sector aspirational and inspirational. So we talk about invitations to partners. So you met how many local designers and... We had three come to site. Yeah. yeah so and we've picked one now that's going to... Oh, one, yeah. So that's exciting. So when do you think we'll be in a position where people could potentially hire the main house and come and stay? Definitely. No so pressure. Hopefully hopefully after Christmas. Nice. It's in January. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So that's really special. Okay. Let me just check my list of questions, Charles. Uh, I think that's everything I had on my list. Is there anything you'd like to ask me that we haven't covered? Um, no. I'm going to see my list of questions for you. That was a question. Question, that's true. Correct. Josh, you're just telling us how long is left of recording, how long? Eight Eight minutes left. Eight minutes. Okay, so um, we're about to try a few different options because we don't know how we're going to end these yet. So one one thing we might do, Charles, with you being the first person Mm -hmm. to do this. So you get to set a question for the next person that sits down. Thank you, Steve. And sorry, stealing that from uh, Diary of a CEO. Um, so you don't get to know who the next person is. Okay. What is the question you would like to set? Okay. You can set any question of your liking. The question is, why is Mornicott the best site in the OCD? <laughs> <laughs> that presupposes any, the next person we speak to is from OC and That's a, understands yeah. Mornicott. Yeah, that knows about Monica. Yeah, okay. They fine. don't have to be from OC. They just have to. Know. No, that's true. That's true. They can do that. Um, the next question we could ask in terms of endings is what is the biggest misconception you think about living and working in the rural economy that people don't understand? I think if you're from outside the rural economy, so you clearly don't understand it, you think it's, it's all wonderful living in the countryside and money grows on trees and lambs just spring out of the ground yeah and two days later you can eat them and it's all wonderful <laughs> um so i think the actual day-to-day on the coal face is very very different and things that might work in a rural area won't necessarily work in the city and vice versa and so it is a completely different lifestyle completely different set of rules and i think yeah People I, I think that's a great way to finish from my perspective. Um, I think there's so many misconceptions and the key thing is we need people to have more opportunity to live, work and play in, a, in the rural environment and genuinely understand it. The difficulty for us comes in managing that in a way that it's only beneficial for the environment and not damaging and such and um, we've got a bit of time to figure that out. Um, Charles, thank you for being the proponent and the cause of the first shoot room session. Um, so that's us done. Bye-bye.